Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this time together. Yes, Lord, Lord, we especially welcome your presence. We especially welcome your Holy Spirit to have a way. Just here. Yeah. We love to hear your voice. We love yes. to hear what you're saying. We love to hear you. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, as we listen to David, that we're going to hear from you. Mm. So we bless you, Jesus. We give you glory. We thank you for your kindness to us. Mm. And we thank you for this opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, honey. Um, it's just so good. And um, honey, you might need to mute there. I can hear myself. Uh, she's sitting it separately, but very close. Can you just mute your volume? Because I'm getting feedback. There we go. Yeah, that's better. That's it. So it's a joy to have um, you all with us tonight. And uh, welcome for those who just jumped on. And um, You know, we were, David and, and a few of us were just reflecting on what God's doing right now, uh, not just around the world, but also in this nation. And I was quoting you before, Katie, and uh, some of the stuff you put out today. Um, and so, you know, we've in my mentoring with a, a number of emerging apostles, we've been talking uh, about alignment and God's strategy uh, about this kingdom sequence that um, must take place for the kingdom of God to be established on the earth. And we've been using some of Mark Pfeiffer's stuff on his book, Alignment, from a long, a few years ago. And uh, one of the things that's really grabbed me is the fact that true alignment only takes place in our lives and also in the kingdom of God when this apostolic sequence, sorry, this kingdom sequence begins to happen. And so he talks about um, uh, authority, he talks about order, he talks about function, but then also he talks about blessing and he, and he redefines what blessing is. And can I just read it to you? Because it's very, very good. For those who've already read the book, you know it, but I just wanted to remind us tonight because I know we're going to step into this more in detail tonight. And blessing is best described as advancing the kingdom of God on earth. We're not responsible to advance our ministry or our church, but the kingdom. Um, we're called to create blessing on earth for humanity by advancing the kingdom of God. So the new definition has to be uh, for to being blessed by God. Are you advancing the kingdom? Then you're blessed. So to do that, um, he goes on to say, you're called um, to what territory or ministry are you called in? What, what mountain are you called in? Your sphere of influence are you called in? And um, so we've been talking about this for a number of years, haven't we? That um, to expand the definition of ministry to not just the religious mountain or the church, but all the, what we call the, the seven mountains of influence um, in society. But realizing that, the bottom line of success in ministry is the fact that we need to be influencing our mountain or our territory. And um, so the, the question is, I guess, what's the condition of your territory? What's the condition of your mountain that you're called to? And um, are you able to really begin to subdue and begin to influence that, that mountain? And our heart is even tonight, part of why we're doing this is to equip you um, for mountain climbing, um, for really beginning to practical ways to help you begin to not just redefine success in ministry, um, but to think like more and more, not just like a father, but also a, a general um, in, all, in whatever mountain you're in. And so that's some of the things that we've been chatting about online in our mentoring and um, seeing the need for rapid change in mindsets and and God's doing these sorts of things already. There's a new kind of leader coming forth in this new era. Um, so, you know, it's just a real honor tonight to, to have David Belestri with us. We know him, him, most of us, from December, and we just couldn't get enough, David. We had to have uh, round two. Um, so over to you. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A uh, time at the end, guys. And I'm, sure. I think nearly all of you now are muted, but... Uh, when we come to the q and I'll ask you to unmute um, if you have a question. Maybe you can raise your hand. There's actually a, a, an opportunity on your, you'll see them, um, how to do that. But anyways, David, over to you and we'll mm. come back at the end and, and 
That's Wonderful. Three together. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Bruce and Cheryl, and uh, thank you for uh, just the great opportunity it is to speak to a, a, a you know a virtual room of um, people that are really I know I know most of the faces on the screen going after um, you know what I would call the apostolic dimension, and we at the end of the day we we're, we're God lovers. We we we're going after Jesus. But we, you know, there is undoubtedly uh, a grace that has been released and is being restored at a greater measure. I think it's always been in the fabric and the life flow of the body of Christ um, uh, for 2000 years. But of course, we are in the many different expressions of our world here trying to understand what it means to actualize the apostolic dimension and um you know it's it with every restoration restorational work of the spirit there is always a season where um we we need to spend time to bring definition and so there's this almost the season of the teacher that must come uh that to bring biblical definition so that when we say apostolic or apostles that we're not talking about 30 different concepts that that we are honed in to what is what is an apostle as defined by a biblical standard and um tonight uh i i really felt just in prayer uh one of the things that i i want to uh, take you know the next 30 minutes or whatever it is to unpack a little bit and then have some dialogue with you. Um, <laughs> this thought of um, what does it mean to bring execution to apostolic grace? If we are people that are um, claiming to um, have be 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 engrafted into or uh, be walking in um, an apostolic anointing. What, what should the outworking of that look like? Because if we claim to have a grace and there is no evidence of that grace in our lives, um, effectively in our lives, um, do we really have that grace? Or are we, are we, 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 can be, we, we can be curious about it or maybe open to the receiving of the grace, but the, one of the premises you know, that I'm going to come to tonight is that that to be functioning with grace inside of us must have an outworking, and that outworking must have traction in the earth, right? Grace is not, um, uh, I, I want to say things without being too controversial, and then, and then, you know, I've got to mix it up, but the the arena of grace is the earth, not heaven, right? Because because grace is the divine enabling of all of heaven's resource through the vessels of grace, us, that has an effect on the earth. Now I'm going to define some of this a little a little further, but I want you to really hear what I'm saying here. That that. Grace has a consequence, and that consequence, the grace on our lives must have a consequence, because here's the interesting thing. The Bible never, never charges the believers to, uh, with, with regards to the understanding of one another, to judge the manifestations of each other's lives. It doesn't, it doesn't actually ask us to do that. It asks us to judge the fruit. The, the fruit. So, so someone can be living, a believer can be living uh, in a realm that seems gregarious in the sense of manifestations of, you know, let's call them spirit activity. And yet, and yet when there is a testing of the lasting kingdom fruit, there's a, there's a disparity, right? There's a disparity. How many you know, without naming them, how many ministries do you know that sensationalize 
the realm of what they would call spirit manifestations. But but if you've been around a bit and you watch over the course of a decade or, or longer and you go, I'm still hearing testimony of manifestation, but I do not see the outflow of, of a lot of kingdom fruit being produced, just more call to manifestation, right? And so um, I, I, I want to share with you, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to see if this works and um, hopefully it will. And uh, you can tell me whether this is coming up. Okay. Um, can you can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to minimize this and okay, I'm going to do it this way. All right. This is going to work. Here we go. Let me just come up here and oh, okay. It's going to do it this way. All right. Um, so tonight I want to talk about this thought of the execution of apostolic grace, right? And I want to use this scripture in um, in in Romans uh, one. So here, here it goes. It says um, this is Paul speaking, and he says through him, this is talking about God. He he says through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you're also the called of Jesus Christ. I like I like the way that the Passion Translation grabs a hold of this, uh, you know, Brian Simmons here. He says, through him, that's through God, grace has cascaded, what a great imagery here, has been cascaded into us, empowering us with the gift of apostleship so that we can win people from every nation into the obedience that comes from faith to bring honor to his name, among, among who you are uh, the chosen ones who are called to belong to Jesus, the anointed one. The, the point I want to make here is that Paul says in the execution of his ministry that he received grace, which I, I believe that the church at large particularly the charismatic church has become very familiar with the 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 thought of grace uh, I, I want to translate that as anointing as well we become very familiar with that the need for that but the second part we haven't become as comfortable or as familiar with which is this notion of apostleship paul said he received grace and apostleship for the execution of his ministry right so then uh, so here's the thought. Then, then we go. Okay. So the mechanism of grace, um, uh, or the the manifestation of the grace that we receive from God. My premise tonight is that it we we have to do more than just receive grace, the supernatural empowering of the Lord. We must go beyond grace, or or, or take grace with us into what I'm calling activation through apostolic ministry. And so in Ephesians 4, 7, it says something. It says, but to each one of us, grace was given. So thank God that not just leaders, by the way, but all believers uh, are apportioned grace. Now, in Ephesians 4, uh, it's not just talking about the grace that all believers receive. Uh, Paul's obviously going to make a point now about the Ascension Ministries and, and the gracings in which they receive, right? But it says, uh, grace, which is the divine enablement of God, is invested into us always for the purpose of a divine intent. Now, you can call that destiny. You can call that assignment. You can call that purpose. Nevertheless, uh, grace always is attached to an assignment, and um, and I'll explain while I'm why I'm hammering this a little bit in a moment. It'll become a bit more clear. But let me just touch now. And of course, uh, I know I'm preaching to the converted here around when we talk about apostolic function, because of course, uh, what is the whole premise of Ark in this network is the championing of this. That, of course, apostolic function, which is 
uh, the apostle is apostolos, it means sent one. Uh, it means an ambassadorial representative of the king and his kingdom who is on assignment. So what I'm trying to do here is connect to you that the grace must always touch this apostolic mission. So, and the apostolic mission being our ambassadorial representation of the king and his kingdom uh, on an assignment to colonize the territory to which we are sent with the culture of the nation from which we are sent. So what I'm saying there is that the, the, the premise of grace must work through us as apostolic ambassadors to heavenize, culturally heavenize the, the spheres in which we're called to. And so, well, then you go, okay, well, what does grace manifested look like? And I've written here that some of the manifestations of grace, which I believe is resource for the execution of the assignment that we're given, are things such as, of course, uh, prosperity, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, greater anointings, mir miraculous anointings. Uh, angelic uh, activity around our lives. That is a manifestation of grace. The ability to take the word of God and through apostolic infusion and revelation to turn the word of God or, or release the word of God in a way that affects the cultural disposition of the people that we're called to. And, uh, and the other thing that the apostolic grace does is particularly to apostolic leaders is it brings around us attracts around our mandate specialist ministries uh which i would say are the other fivefold um now let me make a couple of statements here about this thought of grace and apostleship i believe that the body of christ particularly again in our pentecostal charismatic streams has focused largely on pursuing grace for ministry, and I've put here as anointing. Uh, so I, I think we've been good in that, and and I think you, all you need to do is going to a local, you know, Christian bookshop, or just you know go online and look up um, when you look up Holy Spirit or you know anything like that. There's a uh, there's catalogs of books and books and books on the anointing, uh, on the supernatural, and thank God they are. Some of them are outstanding. The challenge with, I can't say most, because I mean, I haven't read a thousand of them, are probably close, but um, the ones that, that I come across, one of the, the, the glaring challenges is that most of those books struggle to translate the thought of the work of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of, of the supernatural, uh, or the dimensions of healings or miracles uh, beyond the scope of individual salvation. Uh, and that, you know, we know, we, again, many of we know that the church has been, the body of Christ has been orientated to a threefold emphasis when it comes to ascension gifts of, of course, pastor, teacher, evangelist, and that's one of those challenges. The second thing here is that I see that the testimony of the book of Acts is that the early church, when it, with regards to anointing, um, went beyond miracles. They had miracles, and they had signs and wonders, and thank God that the testimony of the book of Acts, uh, you know, is littered with dreams and visions and encounters and all of these things. The thing that I would say to you, though, is that when you think about what was the outworking of that grace, what did it in its landing, what did it do? Were people getting saved? Yes, they were. But it went beyond that. Uh, and it began to affect not just individual people, but literally regions and cities. And we see Paul and the Apostle Paul and his team uh, time and again. Uh, becoming disruptors of entire cities because of the anointing on their lives. And uh, at our gathering, at, at the Ark gathering at the end of last year, 
I went on to explain um, what I think is not the only example of this, of course, in the book of Acts, but in Acts 18 and 19, we see, by the way, what I'm about to say, we see it in Acts 2 in Jerusalem, Acts 4 in Jerusalem, and, you know, we see really the first six chapters in the book of Acts, we see the testimony of the impact of the anointing being translated into not just conversions of people, but impact to a region. But I I, I made the premise, uh, and just for those quickly, the quick summary here is for those that weren't uh, at the gathering and hadn't seen those videos, I spoke about how really towards the end of Paul's apostolic ministry, how when he goes into partnership with Aquila and Priscilla uh, in the tent maker or that bivocational space when he's initially at Corinth, but eventually goes to Ephesus, what we see is that there's a translation of the grace on Paul's life that begins to go beyond individualistic salvation or even the manifestation of the anointing in church service or ecclesiastical spaces. I mean, he's kicked out of the he's kicked out of the church or the synagogue after three months anyway, and he sets up the Hall of Tyrannus. But what we see is we see this anointing begin to outwork itself in his apostleship as it begins to reconfigure the uh, the, the the philosophical um, the philosophical culture of the region of Ephesus, right? I mean, they bring out their, their which as a result of the the execution of the anointing and the the apostolic release of it, we see, you know, the people bring out the equivalent of $4 million in present day money worth of sorcery books and have a bonfire in the middle of the city. We see that the anointing and the grace goes on to impact the financial, literally the, the financial infrastructure of that city that was tied to, of course, the selling of silver and the idol trade. And it, he, it, it, the anointing touches beyond salvation alone, beyond even the philosophical structures, it begins to touch and affect the economic dimensions of that city, which then provokes the riot. But then we see in the midst of the riot, we see another signal where we see that Paul, the, the anointing on his life, has actually penetrated now into the upper echelons or the aristocracy of the region of Ephesus because it's the it's those in high official places that have become Paul's friends who send him word not to come into the 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 amphitheater there uh, because they're concerned for his life. He's he, you know so the penetration of that anointing has broken beyond the containment barriers of what. You know, I know for me, what I was used to understanding the what where the anointing was supposed to flow from. And so the last statement I wrote here is I believe that much of the containment that's con that's happened uh, with regards to the anointing is because we've seen the commission, the Great Commission, as one of individual discipling of individuals and not the kingdoming. Yes, I've made that word up. Kingdoming of the earth. And uh, so, so let me just just quick go through here. The, the, so the other part of it is this thing about, okay, so so grace and apostleship, because I want you to hear tonight, my exhortation to you is to say, I, I want you to, of course, I'm not trying to diminish this sense of God, we need your presence, God, we need your anointing, God, we need your power, we need the encounter dimension, we need that. And we uh, thank God uh, we were just talking before some of you came on uh, about some of the, the 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 brush fires of revival we see uh, happening in the States there. There's currently something happening there in Ashbury College, and we're seeing, you know, breakouts even here in Australia, Numa Church uh, uh, having, a, a, you know, a mighty move there. But but my, my, my challenge, uh, I'm celebrating all that. But but my prayer continues to be God. Uh, may may those things be uh, fires of renewal and refreshing and revival. But God forbid that we would keep them contained uh, to a to to a church service or an ongoing church service. And this thought of you know the the apostolic the apostolship of the grace 
which is what we want. We we want the grace, but it's like, God, this has to become outworked within the infrastructure of our lives. Uh, it's it's the apostleship is this thing about, um, you know, the translation is the, the rule of Christ in his kingdom uh, must become manifest in your and my life into the people that we're assigned to, into the places that we're assigned, and into the spheres that we're assigned. So we're talking people, uh, these are individuals. We're talking places, so we're talking geography. Uh, my geography, of course, my is, you know, I'm, I'm here on the central coast in Sydney. But then spheres, of course, is that, uh, is congregational spheres, um, uh, marketplace spheres, uh, spheres of mission. The, this, this must be the grace in our lives has to have effect and consequence into those spheres, and it must be evidenced. And I say that as someone that is not unfamiliar with the with the the dark night of the soul or the contrary seasons in the spirit that we all go through. The challenge is um, contrary seasons is biblical. Uh, a contrary life is not. That that there is that. In, there must be a beginning and the end to a contrary season in all of our lives, that it cannot be that the totality of our lives is a walking contradiction. In other words, we are of, we, we have this massive grace and anointing, and yet we have absolutely no manifestation of it evidenced. And it's like, oh, well, uh, that I'm the hidden of God. Um, I, I just don't see that in the word. Um, the anointing um, in an apostolic sense must translate into manifested destructions of the works of the devil. Jesus himself, um, it, the testimony of Jesus is that he went around doing good, destroying the works of the devil. Um, it, it, the grace is given upon your life. The peculiar grace that is assigned to your lives is given to you um, for the manifestation of the divine mandate that each of you have been assigned. And that must be translated and it must be outworked with what we would call effective ministry. And I understand the warfare that sits across uh, and against apostolic ministries. It tends to, I tend to find that the warfare, if you're called peculiarly to apostolic ministry, is is heightened particularly apostles and prophets i think receive not that not that god doesn't uh, that sorry that the enemy doesn't warfare against teachers or evangelists and pastors he absolutely warfares against all all the dimensions of christ all those fivefold dimensions but there is a, a level of warfare that the the apostles and the prophets experience that that must be overcome and and to be honest, they're graced in a manner that is greater than the other three uh, fivefold ministers to overcome uh, that that level of warfare. They're graced for it. That's why it, it it is a danger and a tragedy for, say, someone who is an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher to begin to assume and declare and try and behave uh, as if they are called to be an apostle or a prophet, not because an apostle or prophet is better, but the warfare that is attracted to, to those gifts uh, are very different to the warfare that are attracted to the other fivefold. Um, I've, got, I've got more slides, but I, I, actually, I actually want to kind of, I, I want to chat with you more than preach at you tonight because I, I know that many of you are uh, dynamically um, well versed in this space and um, I I just wonder uh, just in that I've, I'm about halfway through that presentation and we might not get back to it because I the, the the analogy I wanted to give you is Daniel in Babylon outworking the grace that he and his partners engage with in Daniel 1 and the translation of that grace in their apostleship before Nebuchadnezzar that brings great consequence and activity and kingdom advance uh, in the midst of, you know, 
I just cannot imagine what the operation of the kingdom in the midst of that sorceress Babylonian culture would have been like. I mean, we, I just don't think we're even in the game ballpark of what that would look like. Um, you know, and and we have a greater and a greater covenant to operate under here. But I I wonder, uh, without going too much deeper into that presentation, I, I sort of said a bunch of stuff here at the at the staff that I'd love to, um, Bruce, if you're happy to maybe open up and have some dialogue uh, on it tonight, would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, let's do that, David. Mm, uh, love to hear um, it, it, a comment or um, if you, it can be a question, but it can be a comment, whatever, however it likes. Let's let's have a chat. Dave, just a couple of comments. I think one is coming into the office of an apostle is a, a growth thing. People aren't born fully developed apostles. Mm overnight you know there's there's transition as you grow in terms of your metron and the grace that's upon you so just the the other thought is do you believe that the full authority of the apostles being poured out in the time that we're in or do you believe that we're coming into a, a period where god's about to pour out an even greater level of authority upon apostles i mean um it seems to me that that there's there's still more more anointing anointing is not the right word now, but but right. there's there's more authority to be poured out upon apostles than most apostles in Australia and abroad are currently functioning in, and I, I don't know if that's because of our understanding, or if that's because of a grace factor that God is 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 doing just wanted your thoughts mm, around mm, one the emergence of an apostle and yeah. the grace associated with that and yeah. and two whether you believe in 2023 and god has poured out the fullness of his grace upon the office of an apostle or do you believe that in a time to come we're about to see greater anointing greater power greater authority mm. given yeah. to the apostle yeah, thank you, Peter. That's great. I, I, I read a funny comment the other day about a pastor saying, I can't find any youth leaders. They're all apostles now. <laughs> and, you know, because it's, it's uh, so I, I agree. I think that the, it's interesting, even, even Paul, um, you know, when, when Barnabas goes and gets Paul and brings him to Antioch, you know, and there's the testimony of he there with Barnabas and some of the others, it says that there were prophets and teachers in Antioch, not apostles, right? And it's only it's only after the a dynamic work of the Spirit in the midst of that region of Antioch that it's almost like something got unlocked from heaven out of that teaching prophets space that released a grace that the Holy Spirit said, now I'm going to release another dimension called apostles, not that they weren't the apostles of the lambs, but Barnabas and Paul really become the first uh, measure of this release. And so I, I, so, so let me, I, I think that, I think that whilst you do, people do grow into the fullness of their apostleship, um, what I, and, and, and sometimes what happens is as they're growing into it, people might call them different things. Oh, they, that's a pastor, and then they're an evangelist, you know. Um, so I, I get that there, there's a like, almost like a progression there that happens. Um, so I, I agree. I think that the formation of an apostle takes a lot longer than most people would think. And, and, and you can have apostolic dimensions in you that are still not unlocked, even though you're called. There's a there is a process, and part of that process, to be honest, this this will, this isn't going to be a great. Uh, this wouldn't be a great Instagram post. Part of the process is suffering. You you, you must suffer. Like uh, I'm not a masochist. I don't pray God. You know, let the suffer. You know, but but there's a suffering that you must go through that calibrates you, and and almost 
destroys uh, the, the the work of godly suffering is to actually um, deliver your soul from wanting to control the process till you literally become this thing about God. I'm a body, like sacrifice and offering. You don't. Rec- Here's my body. Do whatever you want. You know, we 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 stop helping God. <laughs> so I think that that's that's a key process of of coming into apostleship. But then to your second point, I think it's a really profound question because you're you're right. This thought about is is what we're seeing in and and maybe say present day apostles is that like you know are, are we there? Um, I don't think so at all. I, I don't think so at all. And and I think at the end of the day. Um, the ultimate outworking of the apostolic dimension um, actually isn't so much about um, power apostles. I think it's about uh, apostolic dimension becoming the dominant uh, expression or the dominant operating uh, environment of the body of Christ again. Because, see, our challenge is when Jesus births the church, Jesus births the church in a dominant apostolic dimension. So the book of Acts is a testimony of the body of Christ in the earth at that time, dominate, dominantly operating out of apostolic dimensions. Our challenge is that the body of Christ for at least the last century, if not the last couple of hundred century, uh, a couple of hundred years, has not not been operating out of an apostolic dimension. And so until that comes into play, I think what's on what's available to us is not only will we see great ap- apostles rising up, but we will see the believer, I'm talking about the everyday saint, right, operating their lives out of an apostolic grace and and you know, an apostolic grace that captures all the other fivefold. I, I mean, I think the ultimate is when we have um, believers that are, I'm talking everyday believers, I'm talking mum and dad, I'm saying young person that are apostolically wired, prophetically tuned, pastorally dimension, have a teaching dimension to understand the word and, you know, an evangelistic spirit inside. I'm talking the everyday saint. I find it interesting when Paul addresses the churches that he addresses the saints. He addresses the saints. Uh, now he does, he says to the to the saints and leaders. I, I find that ironic because it's countercultural. Uh, Paul had such a high, high understanding of the potentiality of any any man or woman that would say yes to the living life of God emanating in them. He had this grand vision of them being these temples and uh, so I, I I think Peter that I do think that I mean I think John Alley might probably said it once as I, I remember hearing John Alley say it and another prophet say it he they said I think that we are somewhere in the midst of the first forty years of a five hundred year move of God <laughs> and so so I I think there's a lot more to come and. Um, yeah, let's not let's not call the finish line yet, <laughs> but let's celebrate where we are and understand that we're custodians of of this moment, and I so we need to I'm, find fullness. I, I concur with that. I mean, we right. the definition of a new era is an extended period of time, and if we, you know, Cindy Jacobs announced that it was a new Reformation in two thousand and seventeen, which is was five hundred years right. of Reformation. <laughs> so, you know, we, we are just beginning, aren't we? Um, but you know the wonderful thing that I find is yeah. that apostolic grace right. looks very differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone needs to mute, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, they're good. Um, yeah. So uh, the apostolic grace, the understanding of what the apostolic grace is changing. So right. the, this, in this new wineskin, there's actually an opportunity to see things very, very differently. But I mm. agree with you. There has to be transformation. We, we can't right. say that we're functioning apostolically if we're not bringing transformation in whatever sphere we are, are in. And, you know, um, Chayanne and others te- teach about city city apostles and regional apostles yeah. and, and then people who are in the business sphere like yours and different, mm. numbers, you know. So, but there has to be transformation. Otherwise, we're not being apostolic. 
So, right. you know, right. so that's, thank you. Steve, I noticed you made a, a comment there. Do you want to, about John Urquhart, do you want to share? Mm. Ask a question. Um, yeah, just that I don't know how many years ago that he brought out that particular book, but he coined a phrase, apostolic company of believers. So apostolic companies of believers. I think that's what, yeah. David, that's pretty much what you're, what you're talking about. I mean, that, that influence of the apostle um, and that anointing is kind of released body-wide, you know, like it's carried by the demata, the fivefold, but, um, right. but it's imparted. You yes. know, to the companies of believers, and that's through teaching. You mentioned something right up at the start about the need for um, what? What was it that you said for a teaching? A... I said that that it's important that we 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 took the time and and that we continue to make sure that 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 we get the definitions accurate, biblical, so that when we when we're saying apostolic or apostle or or, or whatever we're saying. That we're we're saying it from a biblical paradigm. Otherwise, we'll we'll craft things that we think work, but they'll be almost hybrid solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, many times we when we do that, we build death into the thing at the mm -hmm. start because yeah. of the inaccuracy of it. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And um, yeah, I just I that's just something that. I, I just think that more and more and more and more that um, the right teaching is going to release the next level of anointing um, for the apostolic move. That's just my opinion, yeah. but I, I, yeah. I feel really strongly about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a couple of years ago, at, at uh, I remember at the New South Wales Prophetic Summit, this is a couple of years ago now, um, Izzy uh, sort of invited us up at the end and just, it was kind of this, you know, spitfire kind of prophecy. And she she just said, Dave, um, you know, what do you see prophetically? What do you feel like you see prophetically? And and I, I said this thing in relation to the saints. I said, um, I believe that our paradigm of discipleship has been shaped through pastoral evangelistic eyes. And so it, dominantly we have... Um, discipled the saints with an image of the sheep right of the sheep right which is which is a biblical image and jesus said my sheep hear my voice so there's application to that right but what we've done is we've taken a, an analogy and we've created an overemphasis and so a, a lot of discipleship of and you can see it in most of the programs produce a sheep culture amongst the saints which makes them uh very palatable uh but not not really dangerous you know in many respects there's not a lot of danger to a sheep right except tripping over it maybe um but what i said was that i believe that as apostolic leadership begins to really take its place and begin to redefine how we build that we won't so much have a vision of sheep when we think about the saints, but rather we would have the vision uh, that Ezekiel sees of the heavenly creatures with the four faces, the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of a lion, and that discipleship would be in the, in the apostolic discipling of those four natures of the saints, the, the 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 lion is the apostolic, of course, dimension in the saints. The eagle is the prophetic. The ox is actually the the it's the worker. It's the it's the strength. The the, the even you could say pastoral. Uh, and the man is the evangelist. It's the it's the one that reaches forward. And that there would be this reconfiguration of how we do discipleship, which I think is going to be a measure. We're going to be able to. You're going to be able to test apostles not on the basis of the books they write, but the dis, dis, of, of, on the on the context of the disciples that they raise up. Like, what do they look like? That that will have Paul says to the Corinthians, "You are my epistle, right? You, you're you're my epistle. You're my testimony to the earth. You're my testimony to heaven. You're my testimony to the spirit world. You are the testimony of." the manifestation of the, the grace and my apostleship, you are that testimony. 
So I, I really believe that this apostolic dimension is going to affect the way that we disciples and uh, disciple. And I think that it's going to take a little longer because we'll see that earlier. It'll change the structures, the way we, the way the body of Christ expresses itself. But that's going to take longer. I, I, I'm just going to tell you that's going to take longer. I, I think that's you know very much on a number of our hearts. We we there's a dissatis growing dissatisfaction about the level of discipleship uh, mm. in the body of Christ, and it's not just the lack of it; it's actually the expression of it, of how it's uh, and, and how it's, what it's producing. And uh, so I'd agree with you. And, and also, Steve, you very much, you know, one of the prophetic words God gave me was this is the year for the, the anointing of the teacher, the office of the teacher to come forth in the body of Christ. And I do believe very strongly that um, the more the office of the teacher steps in the fullness of the understanding of this new reformation, that the, mm. we're, we're missing the Peter Wagners. We're missing those that could right. explain what God's doing very simply so we all could understand. And I feel that that's going to come forth very much so, um, you know, now and in, and in the future. But praise God for that. Is there anybody else? Sorry. Mark Mark Hopper's got his hand raised. Okay, Mark. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, just, the, just a thought on that as well, that uh, about the shift that's taking place in that realm. When Jesus went away, he prayed all night, you know, he and he chose, it does say that he chose 12, um, yep. uh, chose 12 um, apostles out of out of you know obviously a large number of people so he even though the 12 hadn't done anything that you know or showed any fruit mm. of that apostleship he's actually called them not uh, disciples at that particular moment he actually calls them and chose 12 apostles which showed us shows us what what that shift is taking place it's not pastor a pastor raising up pastors but Apostle mm. raising up apostles. He said, "This is what I'm going to do, and this is what it should look like ongoing." You know, apostolic succession is seeing that apostolic, you know, it's seeing that apostolic model and mode, and um, seeing the seeing the potential and raising it up into uh, apostolic um, you know, maturity and and a ministry. And I think so. So, like you're saying, that shift of pastors raising up pastors is is now apostles seeing and raising up apostles from from scratch you yes. know from the go um which i think is yeah. is powerful and, and wonderful. yeah that's that's so so right mark and and you know i mean it's one of the keys i, I know i've heard bruce speak about this and several others here um you know even just that what you've explained there jesus doing that you got to think about how how fathering that is right like like it takes a father to see what no one else can see in a in a son or a daughter way like when when there's almost like no indication of it at all <laughs> and and I, I just remember at, at 25 uh my my spiritual father was a guy called Ray McMartin and I think back now about it and I think if I was to meet me with a different face uh if I was to meet 25 year old me would would I have believed in the way that this man believed in me, I I I was full of ambition and arrogance, and you know there was, I don't know what what would have outside of this thought of, it had to be something that the Father Heart of God revealed to His Father Heart to back me because I had I gave him every reason not to and gave him no indication that he should back a a, a young guy like me. There was nothing about it that was apostolic. It was a lot of arrogance and huff and puff, <laughs> orphan spirit, you know, uh, which I, I know, Bruce, you know, you're passionate about this, right? This thought of why we need we, we need fathers and mothers, apostolic fathers and mothers that can believe for, for these uncut gems, <laughs> you know, when many of them can't believe for themselves, right? They, they write themselves off. Yeah, and one of the gifts I believe an apostle is to see, or a father, is to see the potential, look yeah. past all the immediate, and to see the deposit of God. And yes, you'd call it one of the gifts of the spirit, discerning of spirits, but definitely the capacity to look beyond that. And I think that's part of why we need the father's heart. It's not so much the fact that everyone needs inner healing or a father's heart, mm. the fact that you, you can pull out the gold and, and look past the zeal, huh? So, right. Yeah. Right. Some of the 
Well, you think about it, I mean, it must mean, if, if it's true, and it, I think it's true, it must mean that some of the roughest diamonds in our world, <laughs> you know, are, you know, if, if we could, I think it's, is it C.S. Lewis that says, um, it's a daunting thing to know that the most common person that you meet, you meet today, if you were to see them with the eyes of the spirit, it would take everything within you not to bow down and worship them because of the glory inside of them, right? It just, this thought about not, not allowing ourselves to be contained to know each other purely after the flesh, yeah. but, but to carry that apostolic vision that can see inside through and, and to the ones, you know, yeah. uh, that are in our midst and, and just be able to draw. I mean, Paul struggled, Paul struggles with it, with John Mark, right? He, he has this moment, John Mark disappoints him. I'm sure Paul was quite a strong personality. And all of a sudden he rides him off and it's the contention between then him and Barnabas because Barnabas, Barnabas still sees the gold in John Mark, but Paul, they have a schism over it. And uh, Barnabas goes off with John, Paul, uh, John Mark and Paul goes off with Silas. But eventually, thank God, eventually, you know, we see in some of the writings of Paul that he, he sees the error of his ways and he says, don't forget to bring John Mark with you because he is fruitful. You know, he's, he's, he's fruitful. That's, you know, Paul realized that he had maybe, you know, allowed that, that he, he began to see John Mark through the disappointment or the energy or whatever it was. And there, there is this, this apostolic draw that must come. And, and to be honest, I think in, in each of us here, there's people and there are circumstances that are in a similar way that you just go, I just don't know how there's going to be a lot of life or there hasn't been to this point, a lot of evidence that this is a fruitful field. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a dimension of, of ministry that you've been laboring in. It could be prayer, intercession, whatever it might be. And, and, and in some degree, the evidence, because I've been talking about, of course, the manifestation and the evidence and, uh, but maybe you've you've just been in that space where you've gone. This this has not been. I cannot see the fruitfulness that it sh this should be producing, and uh, part of that is just you know the wisdom to know, um, or faith even to actualize that thought that says no. I'm uh, if this is a portion to me, then then I'm going to I, I'm going to produce. It's going to produce fruit, and it's going to come out of an apostolic dimension in my life that that because the the power of the apostolic of dimension is that it unlocks kingdom yeah right that, that the the it unlocks kingdom but it does not do that by default there is still the requirement whether you're an apostle or a prophet or whoever there's still the requirement of faith right so you you can have you can be an anointed apostle but that does not diminish the requirement of faith, the actualization of the kingdom. Like this kingdom is activated on the basis of believing God. That 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 is how and 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 you can have all that anointing inside of you, but you must actualize it. And it's 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 one of the challenges that I see that sometimes we can there's almost like there's disappointment or something. And so we regress, listen to this, into, uh, and I'm a book writer, so I've written books, right? So it's, I'm not against writing books, but we can regress into theorizing, conceptualizing, and taking time to do all that without executing, without executing. And that's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge in an age, particularly in an age where the body of Christ is, um, is is attuned to revelation uh, believers have been uh, attuned to become revelation consumers mm. unfortunately it doesn't translate always as kingdom manifestors yeah. and so we've got everyone's got this high level oh man i read all of dr miles munro you know i i read all of you know whatever you know this and that and yet you go but but there's a disparity here because if you've read all that and you've absorbed that, 
why is it that you're not actualizing that at the ground level of your walk? What what what's the disconnect here? And that's a problem. That's a tragedy because it's it then becomes easy to, you know, um, uh, write another sermon, to do another course, you know, like it. We we got to go and actualize the kingdom, it, you know. We we've got to do that. And I think that we are in 2023. I I think there's an invitation. Well, I I know there is. There's an invitation for uh, particularly men and women, uh, like I said, on this call that are attuning to this frequency of apostolic grace. Yeah. Um, God is is looking for people who He can show himself through because uh it for many in the body of christ it doesn't matter how good a book you write or what how great your concept is until you can bring testimony right they will not migrate yeah and 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 that's um to be honest it's fair enough for some people like it early adopters they're in. We're in. We're 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 here, right? But but for many, and it and it it's it's why God in Acts four it says God gave great power to the apostles and great grace was then released upon the believers. It 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 needed it, and so there's something on us a requirement. It's not a heavy burden. It's not like that. But there's almost like a commission on us to 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 bring forth apostolic works within the context of our churches, within the context of the manifestation of wherever the spheres of our ministry calls us to, whatever it is that we're, you know, I'm sure that there's all these different assignments here online, but but there must be a thing that says, I, I've got to actualize this grace. There must be evidence that I can point to. Um, you, you, you must do that. Uh, otherwise, um, well, you know, you get swallowed up, to be honest, by the haters and the doubters and the you know, all of that. So, because you begin to doubt yourself, to be honest, you know, am I really kidding? Am I really this? Is this, where's the evidence? You know, uh, yeah. You began by sharing that it, there was need, we need both in the apostolic function, the grace anointing and the apostolic manifestation of the kingdom. And, and you know, I think, those of us have been around a while we've seen those with the power ministry the the anointing um the right. song and the wonders but not the character or not the father's heart or not the capacity to to raise up the next generation or even sh shift the kingdom you know and right you know, jacobs you know says that you know dallas is the most church city um in america but it has the worst murder rate and she mm -hmm. contends that there's no true reformation until we're transforming the culture and so right. you know this is a, exactly you know really what we're we've been wrestling with i guess and growing into and you make a statement i've got david's notes so i'll with your permission david can i send them to everybody yeah please please do please and do. so he says the apostleship of the believer is their capacity and calling to the to earth the kingdom of god and to the spheres of their world and calling and that's exactly what we feel that this new era is hey guys yeah. our time's up um i feel to david do you have a few more minutes or, or yes of course no, no. i know okay. you're an hour later there and some of you also <laughs> um, so if you do need to let go please do uh, but i want to speak just to ask if there's one more question and then we'll wrap up is there somebody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question that was really based on what david shared um tonight that would like to uh Say something. You just unmute yourself and fire away. I'd love to ask another one if no one yeah, else no has one. Steve. Hang on. I want somebody. But only if someone else doesn't have one. <laughs> Steve, just hang on. Uh, let somebody else have a turn and we'll come back. Okay? Yeah, that um, John here. I was just um, thinking a little bit about the, um, <clears throat> the, the power that's in a group of apostles. Um, mm. And I was brought to mind the um Saul meeting up with the school of the prophets and then Saul started mm. to uh, prophesy I just feel that there's a great anointing amongst the apostles that as you get as you have a group of apostles if you like a school of apostles 
Right. And I feel that's uh, the word that we apply more to a group of fish than, a, a, um, <laughs> than an educational place. Um, that there's there's a particular anointing for that uh, um, apostleship to right. impact those who are coming in, into contact with that group. Yes. Yes, that's a good that's a good comment, John. I think if we, you know, coming back to this thought, if we recognize that each of the fivefold, you know, we call apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, if we obviously that's a fivefold expression of the one dimension, which is the Christos, the revelation of Christ. And so, you know, if when we talk about apostles, what we're saying is that particular aspect of the glory of Christ, um, when when that is manifested uh, amongst a company of people, that particular dimension, then there is that what what you're saying there, John. There is definitely that acceleration uh, and the heightening of that uh, together, which is the premise that I was talking about. Then saying, I think that works with apostles, but I think that that also works with the body of Christ itself as the 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 climate or the dimension of the body of Christ becomes more apostolically configured that what we're going to see is greater apostolic works at large amongst the leadership but also amongst what we would consider the average believer the average saint i mean i'm just trying to think through about what would it what would it look like if we met one of the believers from the early church you know would would that would the average believer in the early church would they resemble the average believer in the Aussie church? Do you think? <laughs> I think there'd be I think there'd be something radically different and play there, um, but it has to do with the 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 Acts church was dominantly in an atmosphere of apostles led by apostolic grace, apostles and prophets and the fivefold, but it it was not dominantly. You know, we we know this. It wasn't dominantly led by pastors um nothing against pastors that's part of the fivefold but the atmosphere of it there's a, a greater there's just more of the kingdom um available you know at large so yeah and my understanding know. is the more that apostolic office comes forth this uh reformation of it um yeah the more they will the we'll see these other offices being drawn out or, or matured or coming forth as well um, well, I think yeah, yeah, being being, being set into proper being yeah. set into proper place, right, Bruce? Like yeah. we understand, we dominantly understand. Here's the interesting thought: we dominantly understand all the fivefold ministries through the lens of pastor. Mm -hmm. So we understand apostles dominantly through the lens of a pastor. That's why I still find it. I still find that when people, when I say to me, define an apostle. Most people explain a super pastor to me, not an apostle, yeah. right? And I just go, no, it's they're different. And and so most what we we've been we've understood most of the fivefold ministry through the through the prejudice of a pastor. What does what what does the fivefold ministry look like through the prejudice of an apostle? Like think about what a prophet looks like through the lens of an apostle. Like that's a very different person. I, I got to tell you, then who, who the pastor is going to say a, a, a prophet is. What does an evangelist look like through the lens and the eyes of a pastor? I would say to you that an evangelist through the eyes of, a, of an apostle looks radically different from what an evangelist looks like today. Yeah, that's really good. Absolutely different. Yeah. That's really good. Mm. This, uh, anybody else have a question? Or a comment, Steve. Have you got a, a, a your comment? Yes, please go ahead. Um, if we could just try and keep it a little bit. Yeah. Wrap it up. No, thanks. And I'm not trying to not trying to hog hog the time. I'm just real hungry, you know. And um, <laughs> just the way that the freestyle discussion was going, David reminded me of um, something that you brought up in December, and oh. you were speaking about the five challenges to moves of God. Oh, yeah. And point four, there was containment of the new wine to a remnant portion of believers creates elitism and a lack of critical mass within the body. Mm. So true. So my question is this. In Australia, 
how yeah. do we activate and maintain um, apostolic osmosis into the mainstream mm. body of Christ? Mm. Mm. What, what are the keys for that? Yeah. yeah, look, we, yeah, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, we've, we've got to, in one, in one respect, we've got to dismantle the clergy class. But in another respect, we've got to reset uh, um, honor to Christian leadership. Like you can't, you, so, so you can't, you know, clergyism is an elitism, but true Christian, like that, you can't throw out leadership. Uh, you can't throw that out because that's biblical. Yeah. Um, so I, I think what we have to do is rediscover uh, rediscover what it looks like to um, the the oil, Psalm 133, the oil that drips on Aaron's head does not get stuck in his beard. <laughs> it goes to the edge, it goes to the edge of his garment. It, and, and so any model of, of leadership that we have that contains the oil on the head and the beard only, so it creates that super class of leaders that is the celebrity, the superstar, that anything that reinforces that, we we have to re we have to rethink because it's stopping the oil dripping down to the edge of the robe. It's got to touch the edge of the robe. And so that that's going to create a fundamental, well, it, it require a fundamental change around how we how as leaders and leaders, uh, how we execute and and release the grace. Um, again, I just I, I'm not. I I just don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I just I, you know, I just can't. I I just I, some of the patterns that we have are not helpful. When we make a meeting uh, purely about one person, and and they become the conduit of all life in that all grace in that meeting it reinforces a prejudice and then we you know we try and say oh you know this is about the activation of the saints and i went no you you just glorified the clergy you 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 did that and and so we we want something but we're stuck in an old pattern that produces the opposite of what we want and and that's a great challenge amen to that um <laughs> years ago i had the honor of doing a church planning class with John Wimber in, at, wow. in the States as an adjunct. And uh, I asked him a question at the end. And I said, you know, when I was sort of very young in ministry. And I said, you know, often John, because he was talking about the anointing, you know, and, mm. and but he was talking about corporate anointing, you see, right. rather than on one person. And uh -huh. I, said, I said, I sometimes I'm going down the altar call and I'm praying for people. And I'm so anointed and I've got words of knowledge and the power. And then all of a sudden the powerless, why is this? And he goes, it's the trouble with you Pentecostals. You think that one man has all the anointing. He mm. said, because there'll be somebody else in that room with the gift of healing that the anointing's on strongly and you just have to have the wineskin. He didn't use that word, but that's what he meant. Mm -hmm. Have the flexibility in the way you see ministry to be able yeah. to say that there's the, the anointing's in the cluster, not in, not in the one. And, and so- right. You know, right. so we see this pattern re reproducing itself of the, the the man of God, you know, and the etc. But so you know, I, I'm a glass half full sort of person. My, my glass is not quite <laughs> half at the moment, but I am. I, I believe that we're we're on this journey of transformation, and I do believe that that you know that God's beginning to unpack this. And I do yeah. want to say this about books. What books do is that typically God does something new. And yes. then there comes those with the teaching anointing comes or observation that are able to make it simple and explain it to the body of Christ, which is that's important. right. So that's right. anyways, listen, guys, our time's up. Um, I hope you've been blessed. I know I have. Um, I, I just wanted to say two things. One is that um, if you'd like us to do something like this again soon, um, I, I'd love very much to do that. I, I have it in my heart to also reach out to Mark Tubbs, who's, Part of, he's a, on the international um, round table of Harvest International Ministries, our apostolic network, and mm -hmm. he's written a couple of books. But more importantly, he functions apostolically in the nations with great transformation wherever he goes. He takes teams with him everywhere. And um, he's a great friend. And so 
if you guys would like us to keep going, I'd love to have David back and do part two, um, <laughs> maybe in a few months' time, if that's okay, David, or part three. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this was part two. Uh, this is part two, so it'll be part three, yes. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that uh, Papa Chayan has reached out to me and, and talked about coming to Australia in 2023 and actually running, someone mentioned the School of the Apostle. I think it was you, John. And mm. it's really in his heart. He does have an anointing for this. He's been running the School, the school of an Apostle in America now. Uh, it's been, which Sean and I did it over 10 years ago uh, over there. And he really feels like it's time for him to, to do that here. And we're going to, he's hoping to do it in multiple cities in the nation. And we're just working out dates. So we'll keep you posted about that. And it's actually not so much for us, even though we, may, we might want to put up our hand um, to say, hey, I'd like to do that too. But it's actually for those who are still you know, wrestling with what an apostle looks like or stepping into mm. that function. And then lastly, I just, you know, in ARC, we have a culture of honour, and I want us to honour David tonight. David, I've been on your webpage looking at opportunities to give there, and you're not built that way. Uh, there's <laughs> nothing on there. So I was going to say, just, just get on David's website and you can bless him financially. But um, <laughs> you can certainly sow if you go to ARC's webpage, and if you put that and just designate um, David Balestri, we'll make sure David bless him. We're going to obviously honor you that way as well david but most of all i want us to pray uh for you right now can we do that and we, we'd really appreciate you so much mm. my friend and mm. so father we thank you first of all for thank the worthiness you. of what david carries lord for the apostolic authority but mm. also the understand uh, ap the revelation that he carries of what the apostolic looks like and the manifestation of the fivefold offices you, um in this nation Lord, I thank you for his role and his more than his role, his apostolic leadership with the Australian Council, mm. Apostolic Council of, of Apostles, AKL. Mm. And Lord, I just thank you that that um, more than anything, you seem to be just bringing this, the revelation of how to function practically more and more to thank the service in our nation. And thank you, Father, that it's it is indeed time for the the apostles and the prophets. Um, and the evangelists and the pastors to come forth, Lord, especially yes. the apostles and prophets, the foundational offices. So, mm. Lord, we ask your blessing on David as he, he has this key role of um, not only leading the way, but help, using him, Lord, to, to teach and give revelation and insight. We thank you for what you're doing in terms of unity amongst, Lord, the apostles in this nation at this time. And mm. we thank you, Father, for the fact that we seem to be tracking together more and more. I just ask your yes. blessing on David. We ask for increase of not thank only authority, God. but of, uh, of transformation, but also of influence into the spheres that thank he's you. already moving in. But, Lord, I also sense that yet David, God's actually opening up a, a new sphere of influence mm. for you this coming year. And Lord, yes. I just thank you for an expanding sphere of, of influence. Lord, I just thank pray you. Isaiah 54, 2 over you. The Lord's enlarging mm. the place of your tent. And he's mm. not stretching you wide. He's stretching your influence and your effectiveness thank wider. You. And so, Father, we thank you mm. for that increase of uh, uh, the manifestation of this apostolic grace um, that's over David's life, but also, Lord, we ask tonight for everybody that's online, yes, and even and those who watch this afterwards, Father, that there would be such an increase in the not only the revelation but also the effectiveness of of bringing the kingdom mm. of God onto earth, into earth, and so wherever we go. So, Lord, I ask for an increase of anointing, but also an increase of download of understanding, and mm. also of influence of increasing our sphere wherever it is or however okay. it's manifested in jesus name so we Ooh. bless 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 you david and we bless okay. all those online tonight with yes. a greater measure of grace and a greater Ooh. measure of kingdom influence in jesus name jesus name amen and amen amen well thank you everyone um god bless you all it's been great to be together and uh go forth and multiply amen amen <laughs> talk to you all soon Bye now. Bless you, everybody. Bye. Up on Bye. Mark's YouTube page if you want to look at it again in a day or so. All right. Thank awesome. you, Jack. Thank you. Good night. Bye.